This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 296 of the program. Today is Friday, June 25th, and before we get started, I want to thank all of the folks who took time out of their day to support the show by either becoming members through Patreon or YouTube, by signing up to sub uh, to us through Twitch, or by simply uh, sending us a donation through PayPal. This week, that includes Adam Prawl, Chalkweed, Copper Queen 22, Coulter Smith, Crazy Hawaiian and PA, Deep Perez 4301, Dragon 1000101, Gloria Cuevas, James from the Internet, Judy Cook, Literal Lils, Mad City Miss Kitty, Michael Rouge, MJ Nari 022, Mr. G, Prong 999, Scott Collier, Socialist Maker, Torrential Rage, and Zeon Smiley. So thank you so much to all of these kind souls. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or you can click join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. Additionally, if you want to watch more content on Twitch, you could sub to us through twitch.tv slash humanistreport there as well. So this week, we've got a great episode for you. We'll talk about Cold Feet Crowder's debate with Ethan Klein and Sam Cedar, or lack thereof, and we'll also cover the aftermath, which uh, might be better than the event itself, and we'll also address his deeply bigoted and homophobic claim about gay men. Also, corporate lobbyists declare war on Nina Turner. Ford Fisher and Ken Klippenstein share documents that give us some insight into how the government views socialists, and also we'll We'll dissect Tom Cotton's absurd attack on Bernie Sanders. All that and more will be discussed on today's program. Hopefully you will enjoy the episode. Let's get right to it. In an interview with Fox News, Senator Tom Cotton decided to talk about the For the People Act and Bernie Sanders, and he lied through his teeth. I mean, he was blatant and shameless, and it's so bad that you'd think he'd be a little bit afraid of how disingenuous he would come across. Nonetheless, he didn't care, and the claims he made were so outrageous that I feel like even a Fox News viewer should be able to identify them as untruthful. But I mean, uh, regardless, we'll watch what he had to say, and then when we come back, um, there's a lot that I want to say in regards to this segment. And the Congress must address that in any and every way. I mean, that's the that's the uh, the really idiotic argument that he's making. HR one nationalizes elections. But Joe Manchin is offering a memo of a, a halfway point. Make election day a holiday requires uh, uh, require all states to give absentee ballots and partisanship gerrymandering. Require voter ID. You saw the memo. You saw the HR one. Where do you stand? Yeah, yeah. The Republicans don't have a plan to nationalize our elections, Brian, because we don't think we should nationalize our elections. We trust our states and their counties and cities to run our elections, and they've done a pretty good job of it for over 200 years. But that Bernie Sanders line—I mean, I just got to say—it's rich for a guy who honeymooned in the Soviet Union to be criticizing <laughs> Republican governors and legislatures for undermining democracy. Um, I mean, he said he said an op-ed over the weekend that Republicans like me are trying to start a new Cold War um, with China. China, I guess he's still smarting from his loss in the first Cold War with Russia. Um, but this bill, just to give you one example of how bad it is, would actually take your tax dollars and send them to Bernie Sanders and any other politician yep. running for office to run their campaign. So think about that. Arkansans would be subsidizing Bernie Sanders' campaigns. Yeah. Um, I don't think many Americans want to see their tax dollars to the tune of hundreds right. of millions of dollars going to support a po political politicians who they oppose attacking politicians they support. Right. You also mentioned gerrymandering, the process of rigging electoral districts. This bill would allow Democratic operatives in all 50 states to draw districts lines just like they have in places like Maryland and Illinois and it's all it's all built guys it's all built on a fabrication that Republican governors and legislatures are somehow suppressing the vote when in reality states like Georgia are actually passing laws that expand voting access compared to Democratic states like New York and Delaware all these states are doing is making it easy to vote but hard to cheat <laughs> 
So I don't even know where to begin. There's a lot to unpack there, but I'll start with their use of the word nationalize. Uh, when I think about the word nationalize, uh, you know, it conjures up images of a government taking control of a privately owned and operated business or entity of some sort. But the way that they used nationalize was was very unique, we'll say. They were saying, well, you know, this For the People Act is an attempt to nationalize elections. Now, by the traditional definition of nationalize, I, I think that having the government own elections is a good thing. Do you really want to outsource elections to private corporations? But it's because they were deliberately using nationalize in a really weird way. And what they were saying was basically, this is going to nationalize elections to the extent that it lays out standards at the national level that apply to all 50 states. That's a little bit weird. Just say these national standards are going to apply to all 50 states and states are better at running elections than the federal government. They could say something like that, but they did it. And there's a really specific reason for that. They deliberately used the word nationalize because they want to prime individuals who are watching Fox News to think about socialism. So if they use the word nationalize, then people will think, oh, for the People Act, this is nationalization and nationalization is oftentimes linked to socialism and socialism bad. So therefore, for the People Act must be bad as well. That's exactly what they're trying to do. It is incredibly disingenuous, but this tactic is effective. Now, when it comes to federal standards for elections, this is not anything that's new, right? States have control over elections, and usually these are run at the local level, but there are federal standards that exist. States and local governments can't just do whatever they want. So federal standards already exist. It's just that there will be more federal standards to make democracy stronger, but they don't like that. And they can't really say what the For the People Act is in actuality, because if they just explained what it was to Fox News viewers in a good faith and accurate way, then they'd probably support it. So what do they do? They lie and they fear monger. But the claims about the For the People Act perhaps weren't as outrageous as the claims that Tom Cotton made about Bernie Sanders, which to me were just downright bizarre and stupid. So, um, Tom Cotton said, that Bernie Sanders line, I just gotta say, it's rich for a guy who honeymooned in the Soviet Union to be criticizing Republican governors and legislatures for undermining democracy. Wait, so because Bernie Sanders honeymooned in the Soviet Union, automatically that assumes that he endorsed every single element of the Soviet government and the Soviet regime, and especially... He supported the, the authoritarianism. So since Bernie Sanders honeymooned in Soviet Union, he is forever tainted. Is that really the logic that you want to use? So, I mean, Tom Cotton, I'm sure he's been to Israel. Here's a photograph of him shaking hands with the former prime minister of Israel. So it's also true that even though Israel is an apartheid regime, and I'm sure that he definitely endorses that, being the fascist that he is, but this regime also offers guaranteed basic health care to every single citizen. They have a universal health care system. So since Tom Cotton has been seen with the former prime minister of Israel, he is automatically endorsing every single element of Israel's regime, including universal health care. And since universal health care is linked to socialism, according to Republicans, then that must mean that Tom Cotton is also a socialist. And since socialism is associated with the Soviet Union, that also means that um, Tom Cotton must also embrace the authoritarianism that Bernie Sanders embraces. I mean, I'm being intentionally hyperbolic here, but this is the logic that he's using, right? It's like saying, hey, I saw you eating, uh, you know, a chocolate ice cream cone. And since chocolate is the same color as shit, you must like to eat feces. Like, this is the level of logic that we're operating with here. And he knows that it's disingenuous. But I don't think that the average Fox News viewer who sees him say that is going to put much thought into it. He adds, um... Bernie Sanders said in an op-ed over the weekend that Republicans like me are trying to start a new Cold War with China. I guess he's still snorting. I think that was the word that he used uh, from his first loss in the Cold War with China. So not only is he suggesting here that Bernie Sanders um, embraces the authoritarianism of the Soviet regime, but Bernie Sanders also is a traitor. That's correct. 
During the Soviet years, when Bernie Sanders was a public servant, he was a mayor of Burlington, Vermont, he actually was more uh, of a supporter of the Soviet Union than the United States of America. He was a traitor. That's the actual allegation that Tom Cotton is making here. It's, I mean, look, it's almost like I give him credit for being so bold and confident, but yet wrong at the same time. This is Dunning-Kruger in, in action, but... This is a very, very stupid, sick burn. It's it's idiotic, Tom Cotton. And I'm sorry, but it is the case that it seems like Republicans and a lot of Democrats, to be fair, want a Cold War with Russia. You keep ramping up the hawkish behavior, your saber rattling against China in some instances. So, I mean, Bernie Sanders isn't wrong to point that out. Now, let's look at what he says about H.R. 1. What H.R. 1 would do, and, and I'm going to read the full quote because um, I think it's worthwhile. It would take your tax dollars and send them to Bernie Sanders and any other politician running for office to run their campaigns. So think about it. Arkansans would be subsidizing Bernie Sanders' campaign. I don't think many Americans want to see their tax dollars to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars going to support politicians who they oppose, attacking politicians they support. Uh, this is basically a really long and roundabout way of saying, I support our current system of legalized bribes. Because what he's trying to do is demonize public financing of elections. Now, I think that if he actually presented this to Fox News' audience in a straightforward and factual way, they wouldn't agree with him. So what does he do? He tries to sell it in this really bad way. Well, actually, think about this. Do you want your tax dollars to go to Bernie Sanders? When all you have to do is think about this longer than a few seconds and you realize how this is objectively good if you care about democracy. Taxes aren't just going to subsidize the campaigns of people who Republicans don't like. It's also going to subsidize the campaigns of folks like Marjorie Greene and even fascists like Tom Kine. You see, the way that elections work in America, where you've basically commodified our democracy, is you have a higher chance of getting elected if you have more money. So politicians have this incentive to go to billionaires, right? Go to uh, these giant funders who could give them millions of dollars donate all of that at once to their super PAC and then they have a greater likelihood of uh, of winning their election but what the for the people act would do is offer matching funds so that way if you are an average citizen and you donate $25 to a politician well that's going to be matched so it would be a $50 donation so this further incentivizes politicians to actually get grassroots funding for their campaigns and if you do this, corrupt fools like Tom Cotton wouldn't have to beg the Koch brothers for money. I mean, there's a reason why a 2014 Princeton University study found that policy outcomes don't reflect the will of normal Americans. They reflect the will of business elites and special interests. And that's because of the fundraising model. It's legalized bribery effectively. And what the For the People Act does is even the playing field, make normal Americans more competitive with the oligarchs in America. Now, it's not perfect because this matching funds clause in the For the People Act does exclude third party candidates, but passing the For the People Act wouldn't make third party candidates any less likely to get elected than they are now. We need electoral reform, but that's a different story for a different day. Long story short, what it would do is it would incentivize grassroots donations by offering publicly matching funds. Tom Cotton knows that if he just said this is what it would do, Republicans would probably even support that because most Americans know that money is an issue in American politics. But um, again, he doesn't want them to support it, so he's trying to poison the well, and then he tells them what it is. It's just, it's such, if I were a Republican and I found out the way that they lied to me, I would be so furious, right? Just present them with the details, present Fox News' audience with the details as they are objectively so, give them the facts, and let them make the decision. But Tom Cotton knows that if he actually told folks what the For the People Act was, they'd likely support it. So this is why he has to lie. He's insulting your intelligence if you're a Republican. Do you stand for this? Now he also says here um, that gerrymandering is the process of rigging electoral politics. This bill would allow Democratic operatives in all 50 states to draw district lines just like they have in places like Maryland. Now, this right here is a blatant lie. He's just straight up lying. So, gerrymandering is a thing that happens. Um, mostly Republicans engage in it. Uh, Democrats also do. But 
Republicans are far more egregious. I mean, just Google what Dan Crenshaw's district looks like, and that is the perfect example of gerrymandering. But it would outsource the redrawing of district lines to independent commissions so they redraw district lines in a non-partisan way. This actually would even the playing field. But what he's saying is actually this is going to give Democrats more power. No, that's a lie. But Tom Cotton doesn't want independent commissions to redraw district lines because he wants Republicans to actually be able to do what he said. Rig the process right? Redraw district lines to turn Republican seats into safe seats across the country and give them a, a better chance of getting elected in the House. It's just, he keeps lying. And it's so frustrating to watch this because his lies are so transparent. Like, even if you don't know about the details of the For the People Act, with how purposefully hyperbolic he's being, like, the average viewer should be able to see through him, should be able to notice that this guy, like, the things that he's saying, they seem a little bit out there, right? There's got to be more to the story. He's got to be lying to me. But Fox News' viewers are gullible and they likely eat that shit up. And it's frustrating. This is why people in America are so stupid because they get misinformed and lied to by politicians and news networks who are supposed to actually be giving them the details, the facts. But I mean, we saw the way that he misrepresented Bernie Sanders and the For the People Act. Bernie being in Russia means... He is a traitor to America. He supports authoritarianism and wanting to have independent commissions redraw district lines. That is tantamount to uh, Democrats wanting to rig elections. It's just he's a liar and he should be ashamed of himself, but he has no shame because this individual is deeply authoritarian himself. So he doesn't care uh, about how uninformed he's making people. He just cares about the outcome, right? The uh, ends justify the means. Without question, the January 6th insurrection was terrifying, and I want that to not happen again. Having said that, though, I've always been very apprehensive about the implementation of some sort of policy to stop violent extremism in America, because we've seen countless times the way that the U.S. government uses these sorts of incidents to further consolidate state power and crack down on civil liberties. I mean, we saw the way that the Patriot Act used 9-11 to justify the erosion of the Fourth Amendment. I mean, bulk metadata collection, warrantless surveillance. So I don't want the government to use January 6th to justify them taking away more rights from U.S. citizens. And we're learning about the Biden administration's stance towards domestic extremists. And already there's a lot of red flags that journalist Ford Fisher is pointing out via Twitter. He says... Joe Biden's new anti-terrorism initiative classifies anarchist violent extremists that oppose all forms of capitalism, corporate globalization, and governing institutions which are perceived as harmful to society as domestic violent extremists. Now, he also shares this document, and as you can see, it describes DVEs, domestic violent extremists, as, quote, U.S.-based actors who conduct or threaten activities that are dangerous to human life in violation of the criminal laws of the United States or any state, appearing to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population and influence the policy of government by intimidation or coercion or affect the conduct of government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping as per the definition. It also goes on to say mere advocacy of political or social positions, political activism, use of strong rhetoric, or generalized philosophic embrace of violent tactics may not constitute violent extremism. So the definition is fairly broad, and I think purposefully so, you know, it might be somewhat reassuring to see them point out that mere advocacy of political positions that are perceived to be extreme, including, you know, the philosophical acceptance of violence as a political tactic, that in and of itself doesn't mean that you are a domestic violent extremist. Having said that, though, when you look at some of the examples here, you can see that the scope of this, uh, what his administration characterizes as a DVE, domestic violent extremist, is incredibly bizarre in a number of ways because some of the examples listed here, there isn't much evidence to suggest that these are threats at all. So you see animal rights and environmental violent extremists. Um, you know, there are instances of extremism from uh, these sections of society, not incredibly prevalent though uh not prevalent enough in my opinion to be listed in the same category with like far-right extremists like sovereign citizens and then you also see abortion related violent extremists and it says dves with ideological agendas in support of pro-life or pro-choice beliefs now just pause there for a moment like we've heard about violent 
pro-life extremists, right? Threats being made towards abortion doctors, but pro-choice extremism. So it's a, it's a bit of a bizarre thing to include here because to the extent that pro-choice extremists exist, one, are they as violent as uh, fascist groups in America, the Proud Boys, and are they as prevalent as any other extremist group? I mean, I've never heard of extremist pro-choice people. It doesn't really make sense. Also, anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremists, including anarchist, violent extremists, DVEs who oppose all forms of capitalism, corporate globalization, and governing institutions who are perceived as harmful to society. Now, of course, it prefaces anti-capitalist by saying these are DVE anti-capitalists, but still, they're basically like with all of these groups being contained in the same document, like me looking at this as a layman, I see this and I think, wow, these groups are all similar, right? But this is a false equivalence. If you're in administration and you're trying to pinpoint the most extremist elements domestically in society, I mean, you look to the actual ones doing the violence and disproportionately it is right-wingers. Now, that's not to say that the administration uh, isn't expected to like look at left-wing extremists as well. I mean, of course, that's expected, but to, to be so broad in your application of who could possibly be DVEs, that's what worries me. And also what constitutes being DVE, even though they try to lay out a definition here, that could be broadened. I mean, we're constantly seeing what extremist is be broadened. Uh, so, for example, uh, BDS, that's viewed as something that is politically unacceptable we see state governments try to crack down on bds across the country so you know what's to stop the biden administration from lumping in bds because that is technically you know violent because you're advocating for a boycott divestment and sanctions against the israeli government therefore we're going to characterize that as you being a domestic extremist and so really to me i worry about the application of this and ford fisher kind of runs down why these you know classifications are problematic. He explains, the reason I reference this is that as Congress and Biden expand policing power and budgets, the media's framing largely pertains to right-wing extremism. Biden is making no secret of the fact that his administration puts the anti-fascist movement officially in the same boat. By the same token, Biden is apparently concerned about both pro-life and pro-choice domestic violent extremists. An interesting contrast in the document is that militia groups are only classified by Biden as domestic violent extremists if they take overt steps to fight government. Some militias wouldn't be DBEs to Biden. Meanwhile, anarchists need only oppose capitalism without steps. Included in Biden's broad definition of anti-government slash anti-authority violent extremists are DBEs who oppose perceived economic social or racial hierarchies in activist discourse this is referring to those who identify as anti-capitalist anti-fascist and anti-racist as some are pointing out this document does precede every section with dves domestic violent extremists who demonstrate the ideologies in question that said the surveillance state obviously doesn't only investigate slash monitor once individuals become violent and that's key i think that fort fisher here is making a phenomenal point so these are all red flags to me and it worries me because our government, they've been doing this for decades now, right? And we have to make sure that they're not using people's fears about January 6th and them wanting to prevent another January 6th against them. They're not weaponizing that issue to crack down on civil, civil rights and uh, civil liberties. So this is an issue that I will continue to monitor. But of course, I absolutely unequivocally do not condone anything related to another Patriot Act for January 6th. That's not the solution. Of course, the government should take meaningful steps to stop another January 6th insurrection from happening because people died on that day. It was very serious. But whatever we enact, it can't just be enacted willy-nilly. It has to be something that is thoughtful, something that is not overall going to take away liberty of Americans. But, I mean, something tells me that um, you can get Americans to... Uh, be in support of something that's against their own self-interest and you, all you have to do is really weaponize fear a little bit and, and you see what happens so you know it's this is something that is i mean sure they're saying dves right they're, they're prefacing it 
uh, every single thing they say. When anti-capitalist, but only if you're a DVE anti-capitalist. So you have to already be a domestic violent extremist. But as Ford Fisher pointed out, it's not like they're just all of a sudden only going to start tracking you as an individual once you become violent. So what worries me, it makes it seem as if the government views anti-capitalists as big of a threat as they view insurrectionists, QAnon. So, you know, it's just something that we have to look out for. These are a lot of red flags, and I would encourage you to pay attention to this and do not allow people to, uh, you know, condone something like this because they're worried about the broader implications of, like, another January 6th. Don't let fear be used as a weapon against us to take away our, uh, our civil liberties because once they're gone, like, it's hard to get them back. Right. So we just we have to be cognizant of what our government is doing, who they view as extremists. And this is pretty broad. It's something to watch. It's something to just keep an eye on because this worries me a lot. Steven Crowder is probably one of, if not the most homophobic people on the right. And while most of his peers on the right has found more toned down and like covert ways of expressing their homophobia, he doesn't resort to dog whistles. Like, he just straight up says the quiet part out loud. And I've got to say, Steven Crowder is a little bit sus. For someone who is supposedly straight to be that concerned and seemingly obsessed with gay people, I have to assume he's going through a little bit of a struggle internally himself. And everything that he says is like, it's his internalized homophobia getting vocalized in a way that he thinks is going to make him seem more straight when in actuality the things that he says here to me make him seem really gay and it makes him seem like a closeted homosexual uh but regardless of his motivations what he's doing and what he's saying is deeply deeply troubling and he's going to use a stereotype about gay men that has been used to justify discrimination against them for decades and he's going to say this all with a straight face while wearing a cape so at this point this is basically just like brazen hate speech nonetheless take it away steven you i think women generally and, and i mean this don't fully understand the danger at play particularly from um gay men they are definitely more predatory in nature as far as recruiting than women because men are more sexually predatory in nature yeah mm -hmm. i think a lot of women just think oh you know oh he, he's just catty and i always have you know women always love having gay friends and I mean, I've known that for a long time, and I understand it's, it's, it, you're comfortable because it's like being with a woman, but they don't often understand the, the world when we're talking about sexuality that men live in. And so you don't see it nearly as hypersexualized, for example, with lesbian women to the same degree that yeah. you do with gay men. No. Look, here's the issue with, with the homosexual community with men that I need women to understand because often like, well, what's the harm in going to drag queen story hour? Okay. Any woman who has been in a sexual relationship with a man, okay? Think of all the times that the man wanted to have sex, which was pretty much always, and you said, not right now. Now remove the not right now. That's every gay couple. That's why almost none are monogamous. Statistically, it's true. A very, very small percentage of gay couples are monogamous. Why? Because men can have unfettered sex with no emotional connection. And guess what? It feels good. And this is why you have a hypersexualized community. This is why AIDS was exclusive to the gay community in the United States, despite how Fauci lied about it initially. Your chance of getting AIDS right now in this country as a heterosexual, monogamous, non-drug using male is 0%. And it's still statistically zero, even if you haven't been entirely monogamous. Let's just be clear about that. And I want this is a message to mothers out there, because I think fathers always inherently at least understand what they they're, they're overly protective of young girls generally speaking, and then they are, generally speaking, more aware of how they need to be protective with young boys. It's why often women don't understand how young boys are bullied. Yeah. Because it's very different from how young women are bullied. And so you need to understand the risk, particularly with young boys in your household, um, as it comes from this, this community. And what do I mean by this community? I mean men who have kids climb on them, show them their crotchless nylons, and do drag queen story hour. It's not just fun and a little bit peppy or spicy. It's a problem, and you need to be aware of how they're marketing to your kids. Notice how he kind of told on himself there a little bit. Men can have unfettered sex with no emotional connection, and guess what? It feels good. Interesting. It sounds like you're speaking from experience, Stephen. It feels good. Now, um... There's a lot of tells in there. Like, there's a lot of red flags that lead me to believe that this individual is a six on the Kinsey scale. Like, he is as gay as you can possibly be, but he's fighting so hard to, like, 
hide it. So he says uh, they are definitely more predatory in nature as far as recruiting. Now, whenever I hear somebody talk about recruiting in the context of LGBTQ plus issues, I think either one, they're stupid or two, they're gay themselves because you can't be recruited to be gay. It's not contagious, like getting exposed to a gay person or coming in contact with a gay person, knowing that they exist in and of itself isn't going to entice you into making a choice. To believe that you can be enticed or recruited suggests that you're kind of projecting. You didn't make that choice, but you think others also want to make that choice because you're attracted to men, Stephen, but you chose to uh, suppress it and uh, live as a heterosexual. Marry a woman. Look, regardless of what you choose to do, being gay is not a choice. It's something that's innate and suppressing it or not suppressing it. You're still gay. So Steven Crowder here, to think that people can be recruited, that's like one of the biggest tells of all. Steven, do you think that people can be recruited to be gay because uh, they're going to see it as enticing? Is that like what you believe? It feels good. Uh, another tell. He says that lesbians aren't hypersexualized. I mean, say, <laughs> saying that, my head nearly exploded. Have you seen a single music video in the last 10, 15 years? Have you seen the trending tab on any pornographic website? I mean, as a straight man, uh, lesbian porn is probably one of the more popular categories for straight men. They're sexualized for purposes of appeasing heterosexual men. And so I feel like as a straight man, he would kind of know this, right? But he's not really thinking that much about the sexualization of lesbians because he's not attracted to women. And again, I'm just psychoanalyzing him here and I'm not a psychologist, but like everything that he says, the way he acts is precisely the way that I acted as a teenager. Like I thought that if I were as homophobic as I could possibly be, people would think that I was less gay when in actuality, like being super homophobic is a telltale sign that you yourself are suppressing those feelings and you're struggling a little bit. Now, um, he says that uh, a very small percentage of gay couples are monogamous. He also throws out another statistic. Your chance of getting AIDS as a straight man is statistically 0%. So he doesn't even have to cite these statistics to make his point. But the statistics that he's citing, he pulled out of thin air because... They're not true. First of all, to say that a very small percentage of gay couples are monogamous, that's just wrong. And second of all, you shouldn't care because what consenting adults do on their own time, it doesn't concern you, Stephen. Uh, but that's also not true. 30% of gay men are in open relationships, which means that 70% are in monogamous relationships. Now, 30% of gay men being in open relationships is actually higher than I expected. But nonetheless, like he claimed the opposite. He said that it's a very small percentage who are monogamous. Um, on top of that, when it comes to, um, you know, the AIDS rate, it is the case that LGBTQ plus people suffer from HIV and AIDS at a higher rate than their straight peers. But he said that it's like statistically 0% chance that you're going to get AIDS if you're a straight man, when it's actually 7% of heterosexual men that made up all of the new HIV diagnoses diagnosis and heterosexual people overall make up 23 percent of the diagnosis why he chose to lie about this um you know he thinks that it's helping to prove his point like the uh gay aversion to monogamy in some instances he thinks is going to prove that they're like more promiscuous than the average individual but he just like confidently says something so incredibly wrong uses statistics that i'm guessing he pulled out of his ass um on top of that, he goes on to say, you need to understand the risk, particularly with young boys in your household as it comes to this community. So when he says this community, understand that he's broadening out that term. He's not just talking about gay men anymore. He's saying that all members of the community are preying on young boys. Now, he doesn't use an example of the risk that they pose. He cites drag queen story hour. I don't think that's a risk. Dressing up in a costume, that's not a risk to children. You're literally wearing a costume as you film this segment. But what are you talking about, Stephen? He didn't say the word pedophilia or molestation, but he's priming you to think gay men are pedophiles. And so since he seemed so obsessed with facts and statistics, we should actually look at the data here 
when it comes to this issue. So the Southern Poverty Law Center explains, according to the American Psychological Association, children are not more likely to be molested by LGBT parents or their LGBT friends or acquaintances. Gregory Herrick, a professor at the University of California, Davis, who is one of the nation's leading researchers on prejudice against sexual minorities, reviewed a series of studies and found no evidence that gay men molest children at higher rates than heterosexual men. The Child Molestation Research and Prevention Institute notes that 90% of child molesters target children in their network of family and friends, and the majority are men married to women. Most child molesters, therefore, are not gay people lingering outside schools waiting to snatch children from the playground, as much religious right rhetoric suggests. So using these statistics and his logic, the logic that he applies to gay people, is uh, uh, we should really understand the risk that heterosexual men like Steven Crowder pose to children in actuality. I'm just looking at the data, right? Maybe he's trying to lure children and he's wearing a cape after all. Are you trying to appeal to children? Are you trying to prey on them? Get them to, you know, friend be friendly with you because you're wearing a cape? I mean, of course, when I'm saying this, I'm being purposefully hyperbolic, but this is the logic that he's using to demonize gay men. And regardless if he is gay himself or not, what he's doing here is deeply, deeply harmful. Because his audience, they trust what he has to say, and so they're going to think, oh wow, gay men are, uh, are predators. LGBTQ plus people in general, they are a risk to young boys. When that is absolutely factually incorrect and morally reprehensible. So this is a uh, hate speech. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. And regardless if Steven Crowder is in the closet or not, the damage that he's doing to gay people here is truly, truly irreparable. Because these stereotypes, even if gay people are accepted much more culturally now and socially, these stereotypes still linger till this day. They still are used to make people feel homophobic. And for him to invoke this stereotype to demonize gay people, it's truly just gross. And this is like one of the biggest pieces of shit on the internet. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare. You, I had no idea this was going to happen. Oh no, Sam Cedar. Gotcha, bitch. I am incredibly excited to talk about this story, and if you're wondering why I'm wearing a beanie, no, I'm not trying to cosplay as Tim Pool. I am repping my Teddy Fresh merch um, because I'm a huge H3 fan. I've been a fan of H3, uh, both the YouTube channel and their podcast, since 2015, since back in the Ethan Bradbury days. Uh, I love Ethan and Ela Klein. I love everything about them. I think they're hilarious. Um, and lately, the world of entertainment that I adore has kind of clashed with my world of politics and political commentary. And it's so interesting, it's fascinating, and it's it's really, really entertaining. So basically, a couple of weeks ago on the H3 podcast, Ela and Ethan were responding to a clip from Joe Rogan where he called Ela Klein an idiot because she was wearing a mask outdoors uh, during the peak of COVID or whatever. So they were responding and they said something that Steven Crowder then used to like slam them over. Ethan said something to the effect of, look, we're wearing a mask because the government said or the CDC said, so just listen to the government. And Steven like took that as, haha, you're just sheep, you're listening to the government, I'm paraphrasing. But long story short, the reason why you have that background and context is because all of this led to Steven Crowder getting tricked into debating Sam Cedar after years of him dodging a debate with Sam Cedar. So it's funny because Steven Crowder is this debate bro, right? It's like this flex, like it proves how masculine you are if you want to debate people. But he only debates college students, right? People who aren't media trained, but he doesn't want to actually debate people who know their shit. Sam Cedar is one individual. So he is basically offered to debate Steven Crowder for years, and Steven Crowder doesn't want to debate Sam Cedar. In fact, he pulled out of a debate a couple of years ago at Politicon uh, saying that he got cold feet. This is what a Politicon representative told Sam Cedar. So after Steven Crowder took some shots at Ethan Klein, they both kind of had this back and forth, and then St uh, Steven Crowder does what Steven Crowder always does. Debate me, bro. Debate me, bro. You're going to debate me, bro? Um... Yeah, so um, Ethan Klein decided to accept this debate, and he had a little bit of a trick up his sleeve. 
So um, he was going to have Sam Cedar stand in for him to debate Steven Crowder on his behalf. Now, what's funny is that, and I'm going to show a video of Sam Cedar explaining this. Um, when Steven Crowder suspected that Sam Cedar would be joining the debate, um, he chickened out again, apparently. Like, we can only speculate at this point, but he very actively is trying to evade debate, uh, debating Sam Cedar. Uh, take a look. Let Sam Cedar explain this. I get a DM from Ethan, like a week later or something like that. And he says, hey, Steven Crowder wants to debate me. And he's like, that's not, I'm not a, I don't do a political show. He's like, I think you should come on and debate him as I'm, you know, on with him. Mm. And I was like, I, I would love to do that. Thank you. Um, and so <laughs> last week, you'll recall, last Monday, they were scheduled to have a debate at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is 10 a.m., I think it was, Pacific. And so you'll recall last week we started the show early. We ended at 12.30 p.m., which was 30 minutes before uh, the debate that 11 Crowder, to 12.30, yeah, that, if you that, guys remember. That, that, that Crowder had planned with uh, Ethan Klein on H3. And so we connect with H3 through Zoom and... Uh, like immediately after we're done with the show and then four or five minutes later, uh, they go, Oh, we just got an email from Crowder's dad that, um, Steven had an emergency with his, uh, wife who's pregnant. And this is actually sort we of disturbing. We were concerned. We were, con we were concerned. And, um, and I'm being serious about that actually. Um, and he can't do it. However, we will reschedule for next Monday at noon. And Ethan says they knew that you were getting off and uh, getting off your show early and they're afraid that you're going to be debating him. And I, and I got to say that I was like, come on, Ethan. I don't think I said that to him because I was like, I didn't want to be, you know, rude, but I was like, All right, I'm not sure about that. Like. Would he really pretend that his wife who's pregnant with two kids is in jeopardy? I mean, this is the father, this is the grandfather of those kids. If I was that guy, I would be like, look, we have an emergency, can't get back to you. I wouldn't give the details, because uh, why would I? And I'm like, it's an emergency, and I'll get back to you in, in, later in the week to reschedule. But no, they rescheduled it for 12 p.m. on Monday, Eastern, <laughs> which is exactly when we go live. That's so weird. So I was like, all right, let's pre-tape the show. And I pre-taped the interview last week with Stephen Wertheim. Great interview. Yeah. Um, That's why I had to step out. Yeah. Well, if people watch the show today, they noticed also that we were stretched. And that is because we're back in the studio and we haven't quite set up our system to do the show and to output it. And so we were just like, oh, fuck it. Let's just run it. And so... We pre-recorded the intro and the outro to make it for today at like 1030. And so what happened was Dan figured out some technological sorcery because we, we got him so good because we put all the ball in his court. It was his Zoom call. They sent the link. They sent the time. They felt very comfortable that there was no way for us to get him. So we joined their Zoom link this morning. And Dan, as I said, figured out some black sorcery where he could z zip uh, Sam's feet. He could cross the feet. Ghostbuster style. Yeah. Wow. And so we got to the point where we're like, okay, well, let's do this thing. And then kind of Sam just popped up. And the, the result of it, which I don't want to give away, is just Steven had a meltdown. And he gave something away in his fit of passion that it will haunt him his whole career. No way. So in short, um, Steven Crowder, this loudmouth tough guy, got tricked into debating Sam Cedar once and for all. And um, at the time that I filmed this, the debate just went live on YouTube. So I'm anxious to watch that. But it's this is just, this is perfect. Um, 
I have been wanting to see a debate between Sam Cedar and um, Steven Crowder for years, ever since Sam Cedar floated it. Um, and I'm not necessarily someone who thinks that debates are super useful. I think that ultimately it's a performative thing and whoever gives off the best performance, regardless if they were more correct or not, is usually the individual perceived to be the winner. So I don't necessarily think it does a lot to change hearts and minds. Having said that though, someone as idiotic and uh, belligerent as Steven Crowder to actually be confronted and debate someone who actually knows what they're talking about, like Sam Cedar, is just glorious. So, um, yeah. Well, unless you're living under a rock, by now you should know about Steven Crowder's debate debacle. Steven Crowder is a debate bro who does debates on a regular basis, although he does them with unprepared college students. And this is a media-trained individual. So, you know, he likes to debate on the easiest difficulty imaginable, but when it comes to people who are actually intelligent, he's a little bit more afraid of that. So he challenged Ethan Klein to a debate, someone who he claimed would be a layup, but uh, unfortunately for him, he got a surprise that he wasn't too happy about. Steven, do you know that um, the Spartans are, that they are like uh, practice man love with children? Oh, geez. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. I what did I tell you? He was going to do anything he could to avoid. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh, no, Sam Cedar. What a, whoa, oh, what a fucking nightmare. You, I had no idea this was going to happen. I thought, I thought Ethan was a stand-up guy. This is oh, where we are. Wow. Yeah, I told Dave, Dave, remember I told you? I told you. I said, this is, I guarantee you, he's going to do anything he can to avoid the debate. Oh, I just think he believes that he should debate you. No, no, he doesn't. He just takes advantage of, of women with, you know, mental health Steven, issues. He's inclined you know to stand up and do, to his own fighting. I say, right. it's I just hilarious. Let's bring on FM. You would uh, do anything to avoid talking to me. I think you're. The point that you made yes, that that is Joe this Rogan, yeah, Joe Rogan and, and Ben Shapiro and, and Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson and Noam Chomsky and Sam Harris. Everyone's been avoiding. And not just attempting to get your audience by jumping in. <laughs> well, I, I debated <laughs> with uh, Charlie <laughs> Kirk. <laughs> Stephen, I mean, it's okay. about issues. Let's it's about talk issues, about those yeah. issues. That's I think what you're doing some here. Valid yeah. points. You're so clever. I had no idea that you were taking your show off early last time, coming in today with your pig pen peanuts. I wish every. <laughs> you take those off with a velveteen they really button. Are, we must have been Black very worried eyes, about this, Stephen. Like I don't know why. No one was worried oh, come about it. So Sam, I didn't want to well, do let's, it. Let's have Sam, a debate. Come on, no just, I'll worried, tell you what. I have a general. This. I have a general. This is a rule. great opportunity. I don't start a debate based with people on a lie. And how about you get sabotaging? To a, how about you get Stephen? Show yourself, you coward. Stephen, show yourself. Don't show your co-host. Ethan, you should show yourself. Ethan, how can you respect yourself as a man, brother? Stephen, so strong. Steven, you are such a coward. Stop debate. showing your little leprechaun co-host who comes out right, right. dressed hey, like your sidekick. Come on, Ethan, why do you have to bring I'm on a show? Steven! Welcome to the 30th I'm of the really viewership. Why is that the best thing I've ever heard? So you Just have a guy with Steven. less viewers to come on to debate him because you <laughs> He was not ready. And I just want to read back that quote. Once he saw that Sam Cedar was on the screen, he said, Oh no, Sam Cedar. Well, what a fucking nightmare. And he admits that he was tracking Sam's activity the week before to make sure that he was live so there would be no possibility that Ethan can do a little bit of a switcheroo and bring on Sam Cedar. And even like before he spoke to uh, Sam Cedar, you can hear in his voice he was actually trembling like you would see how nervous he was and it doesn't really make sense to me i mean you are a debate bro you challenge everyone to debates it's your shtick you're the change my mind guy so the fact that you won't even engage with somebody else especially when they're on your level you think that you'd want to really test your skills right and debate sam cedar but he didn't want to do that and he proceeded to have a meltdown down and then um he just straight up he left Let's debate, uh, Stephen. Don't hide behind the glass. Don't be a coward. Don't say let's will, debate, Ethan. You've I lost coward. Coward. Debate. Right. debate the coward. Debate the issues. What does it matter who you debate, coward? <laughs> All right, good. You guys <laughs> wow. are good. Thank you. Coward. Steve, you won't even take off the glasses. Uh, I was right. All right, yeah, you can, you can run away. This you is... run away twice. <laughs> Cold feet again. Come on, Stephen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Dude, I can't believe he admit to following... He admitted that he followed.
on the show last week. We got him. He admitted that he watched the show last we week. We got we him. Early. Dude, we played him so hard because oh. he, he literally was following. He saw that you went live, dude. We fucking got him. Oh, my God. We fucking nailed him. <laughs> wow. It's just... um. It's hilarious. <laughs> and <laughs> you're probably wondering, like, okay, he's going to take the L on this, right? He's just going to admit, look, we were ambushed. I wasn't necessarily ready to debate Sam Cedar. I would have prepped if I knew it was going to be Sam Cedar. But no, he's actually trying to spin this to make it seem as if he came out victorious. Yeah. So, first of all, he stuffed the debate segment within a one hour and 20 minute video with the title, quote, the greatest cell phone H3H3 Rex himself brags about it. And he then pinned this comment to the top of that video, which says, how cowardly is it to accept an honest debate challenge and bring in a grifter with one sixth of your following to debate for you? Are you crying? Am I crying? No, I'm not crying. You're crying. Oh, so you're not actually the coward. Ethan is the coward. It's not you who left, wouldn't even debate. Ethan's the coward. And Sam Cedar is a grifter because he wants to debate you. Again, you are a debate, bro. The right has cultivated this culture within political discourse to challenge any and everyone to debates. So you have someone who wants to debate you and all of a sudden you're, you're mad because his audience isn't big enough or you were ambushed when you've done the same thing to Jen Uger of the Young Turks and others. It's just, it's embarrassing. There's really no way out of this and he's trying so hard, like he's in full on damage control mode, but you look like a bitch, Steven. Take the fucking L because you're only making yourself look worse. Like people who are just neutral and they don't have any idea who Sam Cedar, Ethan Klein or Steven Crowder is, like they can see this and obviously deduce, well, the guy who like left mid-debate, who challenges everyone to debates, he must be the one who's in the wrong. He's the one who looks like the coward. But in Steven Crowder's like twisted mind, he thinks that he's the winner. Or actually, you know what? I don't even think that he believes that. I think that he's projecting what he wants people to see. But in actuality, that's all a facade. Like deep down, he is embarrassed because that was embarrassing. Like you are the debate me guy and you left mid-debate. Or you wouldn't even start the debate. You can tell how fearful you were. And, you know, the right-wing media sphere is also trying to do damage control at the behest of Stephen Crowder. So the Daily Wire penned an article in Stephen Crowder's defense uh, titled, Stephen Crowder showed why we shouldn't engage with debate me bros. Now, first of all, again, it's the right-wingers who started this debate me bro bullshit. You are the ones who... Who started all of this? And this article was written in an outlet owned by Ben Shapiro, who is another debate me bro, who just challenged AOC to a debate last year. And now all of a sudden, debate me is bad and you shouldn't engage with debate me bros. Again, you are the ones who started this culture. You made debates a sort of pissing contest, you know, among political commentators. And now all of a sudden, when the debate culture is backfiring, you're against it. How convenient. Now, also, uh, Tim Pool, otherwise known as Pim Tool, he decided to speak up. He actually is someone, to his credit, who did debate Sam Cedar, but for whatever reason, he was really outraged that Sam Cedar would dare and try to debate someone who wants to debate everyone. And take a look. Like, he actually is getting genuinely angry here in this clip. You know, it's fine, Ethan. Do your pop culture comedy stuff. It's funny stuff. I got no issue with that. But don't come into this space where people are trying to have very serious conversations about how people live and how people might die if we don't solve certain problems and then set it on fire and kick the can down the road or just make everything worse. You bring in a con, a con man like Sam Cedar, whose whole business is just burning things down for personal gain, and I'm going to get pissed off about it. Yeah, you seem pretty mad, Tim. You seem really mad. First of all, Ethan didn't just insert himself into the world of political commentary. Steven Crowder challenged him to a debate. Second of all, you claim that Sam Cedar is a con man for simply trying to debate Steven Crowder who wants to debate everyone. And by you saying that Sam Cedar is a con man, it sounds like you're trying to cancel him. I thought that the right was against cancel culture. Now are you doing a flip-flop because they're trying to do what you all want? leftist to do, which is debate. And third, 
Stop pretending like you and Steven Crowder are actually talking about serious issues. Just the other day, Steven Crowder did a video where he was wearing a cape talking about how gay men are predators. You're not solving the issues in the world, Pim Tool. You're part of the fucking problem. And finally, no matter how hard you try to spin this to make Sam Cedar and Ethan Klein look like the bad guys, like it or not, your boy, Steven Crowder, looks like a coward right now. So you can try to do damage control, you can try to spin and twist the narrative, retake control of the narrative, but the fact remains that most people are going to see that this was thoroughly embarrassing for Steven Crowder. So if he had any dignity uh, left, he would just acknowledge that this was embarrassing for him and have some humility and take the L. But you're not going to do that because part of your whole like persona as a right winger is to huff and puff and act tough. I mean, the dude wears gun holsters, right? So he can never show any sign of weakness whatsoever because that would mean that he's a cuck. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you try to portray yourself. People see what happened. Steven Crowder is a coward. And now going forward, nobody should ever take him seriously when he says anyone else is a coward. Steven, this is Jesse. I hear from Sam that you won't debate him, that you have cold feet, and that you are a beta male, beta, if it's true, beta male. And by the way, Sam said he is an alpha male, alpha male, not a beta male, and that you are afraid to debate him, Stephen. Uh 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 uh. And that your father should stop allowing you to be beta. Debate Sam, Stephen. Don't be afraid. Don't be a beta male. So as soon as I saw the poll, which showed Nina Turner uh, having a 35-point lead over her opponent, right then and there, it became evident to me that the Democratic Party establishment was going to get very active in this race, and they were going to try to do whatever they possibly could to try to stop Nina Turner. So they brought out the big guns, and by big guns, I mean Hillary Clinton, and she came out to endorse Nina Turner's opponent. Now, this backfired because this ended up being one of Nina Turner's biggest fundraising days ever. And the same was true for Jamal Bowman as well. So this predictably backfired. And it's like Democratic Party operatives haven't been paying attention and they don't know that Hillary Clinton fell out of favor with the Democratic Party base. Regardless, though, the effort to try to stop Nina Turner is now serious. So now it's time to sound the alarm. And now it's time for everyone who's just been sitting on the sidelines to actually get involved and sign up to phone bank for Nina Turner, canvas for Nina Turner. And if you can, spare a buck or two to try to make sure that this victory is hours because this isn't going to be a foregone conclusion yes she does have a lead but a lot can change when you are working against this establishment machine that will do any and everything that basically has unlimited pockets to try to stop someone who they view as a threat and now all of the corporate lobbying class has come out against nina turner now for the scoop on this we go to the daily poster where andrew perez and joel warner explain as progressive icon nina turner racks up local endorsements and surges in the polls in a closely watched congressional race washington lobbyists and business friendly democrats are working to try to block her victory in the august 3rd democratic primary for ohio's 11th congressional district last week secretary of state hillary clinton endorsed turner's opponent Chantel brown in what observed saw as a response to Turner's association with Bernie Sanders. On that same day, lobbyists and a corporate-aligned Democratic House coalition hosted a fundraiser to boost Brown after a poll sponsored by Turner's campaign found her with a commanding 50-15 to 15 lead in the race. Punchbowl posted an invite last week for the fundraising reception honoring Brown. Representative Pete Aguilar of California, a caucus vice chair of the corporate New Democratic Coalition in the House, was listed as a special guest at the event. The coalition's PAC, New New Dem Action Fund was listed as a host. The fundraising invite says the host committee information for the event was protecting our vote federal PAC, a voter rights oriented political action committee. The organization has an affiliated super PAC called Protecting Our Vote PAC that has made small independent expenditures supporting Brown. The super PAC's treasurer is Marcus Mason, a corporate lobbyist who is also listed as a host of the event. Mason's clients include Fox News parent company Fox Corp, private equity giant Carlisle Group, 
Student Loan Servicer, Navient, the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, tech giant Google, and gig delivery company DoorDash. Every other host named on the fundraising event appears to be a lobbyist too. Virgil Miller, lobbies for oil and gas giant ExxonMobil, telecom firms Comcast and AT&T pharmacy chain CVS Health, and DoorDash. Nicole Venable, lobbies for Apple, Bayer, McDonald's, and Navient. She also represents the Business Roundtable, a lobbying group for corporate CEOs and surveillance software company Palantir. Jerome Murray lobbies for the American Investment Council, a trade group for the private equity industry. He also represents the powerful drug lobby, pharmaceutical research, and manufacturers of America, as well as drug makers Pfizer, Amgen, and AbbVie individually. Brandon Garrett lobbies for Walmart, American Airlines, FedEx, Nike, and the Managed Funds Association, a trade group for hedge funds. Dante Smalls is a lobbyist for UPS. So basically, lobbyists who represent a plethora of sectors in corporate America are all coming out against Nina Turner. These anti-endorsements tell you everything you need to know about Nina Turner and say a lot about her opponent, who was previously begging for Super PAC donations. And so if you want Nina Turner to win, you can't just bank on that one poll that shows her ahead. You have to fight because if corporate America can, they will sink Nina Turner's campaign. And yes, it's Nina Turner. She is a warrior. She's a political behemoth. Having said that, though, this isn't going to be an easy race and it never was. So a poll might be a little bit deceptive in a way because it shows her in the lead. But then people might get complacent, and that complacency leads to defeat, and I don't want that to be the case. Look, I feel confident, I feel optimistic, but I don't want to take any chances. I think that we need to pretend as if it's the case that Nina Turner is actually 35 points down, not 35 points up. We have to have this mentality that it's not over until it's over, until it's called. And so if you truly want Nina Turner to win, which every single person on the left should then now is the time to get involved because the claws are out and they're coming after Nina Turner because they do not want her in the House of Representatives. So that really tells you that if she is elected, what kind of a politician she'll be if every uh, lobbyist from all these industries is coming out so forcefully to try to stop her. It says a lot. A couple of days ago in the program, we talked about a tweet from journalist Ford Fisher where he details the way that the government describes domestic violent extremists or DVEs. And it lays out some various examples that are a bit bizarre to me, right? Of course, it lists all of the far right extremists, but then it also has pro choice and pro life as if these are comparable. I mean, you don't really see much violent pro choice extremists. So it seems as if, you know, this document that Ford Fisher shared was an attempt to conflate all of these groups. Having said that though, simply put, if you want to interpret that document in the most charitable way possible, you can basically view it as, all right, look, any ide ideology could potentially become violent, and the government isn't necessarily saying that pro-life activists and socialists, anti-capitalists, are inherently violent. Having said that, though, to even put them in the same category with far-right extremists is worrying, to say the least. Now, uh, to complement what we found out through Fort Fisher, journalist Ken Klippenstein obtained a document from the United States military. It's a training document, and it does appear to conflate left-wing people socialists, anti-capitalists, with far-right extremists, including neo-Nazis. So uh, this is incredibly worrying, but it's not necessarily very surprising because anti-capitalists, socialists, they threaten the status quo. And even if they're not vocally violent or they don't advocate for violence, their ideology is still a threat to the government or they perceive it to be a threat. So they are instructing everyone to view them essentially the same as fascists, which, um, as a socialist, I take issue with, obviously. So, journalist Ken Klippenstein explains, A Navy counterterrorism training document obtained exclusively by The Intercept appears to conflate socialists with terrorists and lists the left-wing ideology alongside neo-Nazis. A section of the document subtitled Study Questions includes the following. Anarchists, socialists, and neo-Nazis represent which terrorist ideological category? The correct answer is, quote, political terrorists, a military source briefed on the training told me. The document, titled Introduction, 
introduction to terrorism slash terrorist operations is part of a longer training manual recently disseminated by the Naval Education Training and Command's Navy Tactical Training Center in conjunction with the Center for Security Forces. The training is designed for masters at arms, the Navy's internal police, the military source said. While the right has been vocal with its concerns about being unfairly targeted for political opinions, media coverage of the Biden administration's focus on domestic extremism has paid considerably less to what it might mean for movements on the left, including Black Lives Matter, Antifa, short for anti-fascists, and the environmental movement. In fact, internal FBI documents I reported on in 2019 specifically list anarchists and environmental extremists among its counterterrorism priorities. As The Intercept reported in a recent series, the Justice Department's handling of domestic extremism can often be arbitrary and disproportionate to any threat its targets may pose. One example of this is black activist groups, which, as former FBI agent Mike German has pointed out, the FBI has been targeting for many years. Not surprising there. In 2019, I obtained internal documents revealing the FBI's counterterrorism priorities in the fiscal years 2018 to 2020, while the Bureau's 2018 priorities included right-wing groups like militia extremists, sovereign citizen extremists, and white supremacy extremists. It also included black identity extremists and anarchist extremists. The FBI documents suggest without evidence that the term black identity extremist grew out of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is not typically associated with violence. So this is a huge red flag. The media gets people to go along with the government cracking down on who they deem extreme because they're not necessarily giving you the full scope of what's happening. Sure, it's the case like reasonable Americans are going to see what happened on January 6th. They'll feel terrified and think, okay, the government should take meaningful action to crack down on violent extremists. But the media just frames it as, well, it's just cracking down on right-wing extremists. When in actuality, it's cracking down on anyone who they purport to be extremists and who is and isn't extreme is a very subjective term but based on the documents we've read over the course of the last week the government's definition of who is extreme is very very broad and that's intentional right black identity extremists what does that even mean when you think about all of the extremism that we see in the country do you think black identity extremists like are they going around harassing people no that is not the case. Black Lives Matter protests, which is targeted here, um, they're overwhelmingly peaceful. A report by the Washington Post uh, conducted in 2020 found that the overwhelming majority of violent instances, they happened uh, to be directed at Black Lives Matter protesters. It wasn't conducted by Black Lives Matter activists itself. Having said that, though, it's easy to think that Black Lives Matter is disproportionately violent because the media, back in 2020, they were reporting on the violent instances of the Black Lives Matter protests, right? And sure, that happened, and uh, but many marches across the country also happened simultaneously, but the media isn't going to cover the things that aren't sexy. They're not going to just cover a peaceful march of Black Lives Matter protesters. They're going to cover what's going to get them eyeballs. And so you kind of create this false narrative that conflates, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter with right wing extremists. And then this leads to the American people getting duped by propaganda from the mainstream media and sensationalist coverage of news events and basically tacitly accepting a crackdown on all extremists as if Black Lives Matter or black identity extremists are comparable in any way to the far right who had a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan who's actually doing terrorism around the country. So look, what we have to do is be very, very cautious here. I absolutely do not want the left and even centrists to give the government permission to crack down on, uh, on extremists if that means that we're going to see you know, um, our civil liberties be violated. Of course, the government is expected to stop extremism and violence. As American citizens, we have a right to be safe, right? Having said that, though, we can't allow propaganda and fear to lead to us seeing our Fourth Amendment rights being eroded even more, or First Amendment rights being eroded even more. And, you know, with the Patriot Act after 9-11, we saw how fearful Americans were, and the government took advantage of them. And we cannot let that happen again. Long story short, be cognizant of what's happening, be uh, aware of who the government says is and isn't extreme, and make sure 
that you push back in the event you see a crackdown on your first and fourth amendment rights in the event it comes to that right now you know these are just classifications that don't necessarily amount to much yet when it comes to policy but that can change and we have to make sure that we pay attention so we don't allow the government to do what they did after 9-11 and you know have some patriot act 2.0 you know under the guise of uh, you know, tackling extremism in the United States. Ron DeSantis by far is one of the worst governors in the United States. And all of the things that I find irredeemable about him, like that's precisely why he's becoming a rising star within the Republican Party. Like he had one of the worst COVID responses where he actually banned local governments from issuing mask mandates. And because of that, like Republicans are citing his response as something to be celebrated. But he has another law, you know, this is after the law where he basically made it easier to legally run over protesters, where um, you're, you're going to react like he's reacting in this photograph your mouth should hit the floor if you actually know in any way how this could be implemented in a very very negative way i mean right now you might read this law and think okay this doesn't necessarily seem like that big of a deal it's relatively inoffensive albeit unnecessary but the way that this law that he just signed into law can be used is um it's orwellian to put it lightly. So as Julia Conley of Common Dreams explains, Democratic lawmakers and educators nationwide are expressing alarm over legislation signed this week by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, which is ostensibly aimed at ensuring college students and educators in the state feel permitted to express a variety of political views and which critics say could end up punishing professors whose opinions don't line up with those of the state's right-wing leaders. DeSantis on Tuesday signed House Bill 233 into law, requiring more than three dozen in public colleges and universities in Florida to conduct yearly surveys of their students' and faculty members' beliefs to determine the institution's level of intellectual freedom and viewpoint diversity. Yeah. The law is vague regarding how state authorities can proceed if a university is found to be insufficiently welcoming to certain viewpoints. State Representative Spencer Roach, a Republican who sponsored the bill in the House, told the Chronicle of Higher Education the survey results, quote, could shape whatever action a university president may want to take or whatever action a future legislative body may want to take. At a news conference on Tuesday, DeSantis said his government could intervene if it finds universities to be hotbeds for stale ideology without specifying what that ideology might be and suggesting funding cuts could ensue. That's not worth tax dollars and not something we're going to be supporting moving forward, the governor said. The law does not ensure that surveys will be taken anonymously, raising concerns that faculty members could also raise retaliation if they express progressive views or share that they would not welcome certain viewpoints, for example, discriminatory or abusive comments directed at a student in their classrooms. Under the law, students will also be permitted to record professors without their consent in connection with the complaint according to the Chronicle. Now, there's so much to say about this. First of all, I just got to point out that it's ironic that he says that he wants to defund universities if they are hotbeds of stale ideology. You mean like the ideologies that you subscribe to? Trickle-down economics? That's not a stale ideology that's been disproven a thousand times in a thousand different ways? Uh, Really? Um, On top of that, the union uh, in the state or one of the unions in the state that represents 20,000 instructors They're basically saying, look, he's signing this bill into law and he's creating a solution for a problem that doesn't exist because there's been no increase in complaints about ideological diversity. There's been no, you know, condemnation of folks with conservative viewpoints like this isn't necessarily a thing that needs fixing because it's not a problem. And furthermore, if he actually wants to ensure greater ideological diversity, defunding public colleges in the state of Florida, that's not going to ensure greater diversity. You actually should give them more money if you want more ideological diversity, because then obviously these institutions can offer more courses, hire more instructors. So what he's doing here, I mean, I think it's pretty transparent. Most people who know what this guy is about should understand what this is about. As a state lawmaker, Anna Eskamani puts it, sounds like fascism to me. Exactly. I mean, it is incredibly dystopian. It's Orwellian. And 
we know that there's this meme that colleges are liberal factories. So if a college, for example, might be a little bit too liberal or left leaning, well, you know, this is giving him basically an opportunity to uh, defund it based on really broad and uh, vague terms and, and for just unspecified reasoning. It's just, it's so weird. I mean, obviously DeSantis is trying to create some disincentives for colleges and, you know, he wants to make sure that they don't have an incentive to teach a broad range of things, contrary to what he says. You know, if they teach a little bit too much critical race theory courses and uh, women's studies and, you know, a conservative student complains, perhaps that school can be penalized. It's just weird. Like the second the government says, we want to track people based on their political ideology in and of itself. Like, the red flags should be going up in your mind. I mean, conservatives are against a database for gun owners. But yet they want to track students and uh, faculty members based on their political ideology. It's absurd. If you did this to any conservative, for whatever reason, like if you said, we're going to keep track of the political ideologies of uh, members of churches, they would be screeching at the top of their lungs. And guess what? They'd be right. I would side with them in that instance because that is not information that the government needs to know. Obviously, you're just setting up this situation where if you want to, you can penalize them because of their political ideology. Precisely what conservatives claim is happening to them constantly. So this bill is uh, disgusting, and if I had to make a prediction, this is not going to be used in a way that will be beneficial to increasing ideological diversity. It's going to do the opposite. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This victory is ours. And it is, it is the first of many. If you are in an elected office right now, you are being put on notice. That was a clip from the victory speech of India Walton, who is now poised to become the first socialist mayor in decades. And um, it is really, really nice to see this. I'm a little bit late to the party on this particular story, but there's no way I'm passing up this opportunity for really, really good hopium. So for more details on this, we go to Rebecca Sherrod of NBC News, who explains a socialist candidate in Buffalo, New York, defeated the city's four-term mayor in a major upset in Tuesday's Democratic primary. India B. Walton beat Mayor Byron Brown 52% to 45% with 100% of precincts reporting. The Associated Press called the race late Wednesday morning. Quote, I believe we won because we organized. We have a message of care, love, and hope that is resonant with working class Buffalo, Walton told MSNBC's I'm in Moyeldon on Wednesday. If Walton, 39, wins the general election in November, she will become the first socialist mayor of a large American city since 1960, when Frank Zadler left office in Milwaukee. Her chances of winning are high since Buffalo hasn't had a Republican mayor since 1965. After declaring victory, Walton called her mother by phone and was seen in a video recorded by the Buffalo News celebrating, Mommy, I won. Mommy, I'm the mayor of Buffalo. Well, not until January, but yeah. Walton has worked as a nurse and community activist in Buffalo and had never run for elected office. Brown, 62, did not concede Tuesday night, saying the race was too close to call. He has served as Buffalo's mayor since 2006 and previously was chair of the New York Democratic Party and a member of the state legislature. The Buffalo News reported he's weighing a write-in campaign against Walton, of course. There is no Republican candidate in the race. So, as it stands now, she looks poised to win. Um, I'm not going to say that her victory is guaranteed because I don't want to take this for granted uh, and get a little bit too arrogant because, you know, her former opponent in the Democratic Party primary is weighing a write-in campaign. But, I mean, even if he chooses to do this, 
I mean, she beat him once. She can beat him again. And this is a very, very heavily Democratic Party leading district. So odds are they're going to support her. She's on the ticket of Democrats and Working part, uh, Families Party. So, I mean, all around, this is really excellent to see because what she can now do is create a blueprint for other mayors, create a blueprint for the campaign that she ran. And look, it's it's her successes now that will prove how popular socialist programs are. And it's not like she's like extremely radical and she's she is, you know, advocating for seizing the means of production uh, violently. That's not what she's talking about. Her socialism is a brand that is a lot more softer around the edges. You know, it's more social democratic. Um, but I don't want to speak for her. But she talks about basically expanding the social safety and that tackling poverty in a real meaningful way. And when I hear her speak, it really reminds me of the old speeches from Bernie Sanders when he was the mayor of Burlington, Vermont. And it's really nice to see. Now, I do want to play a clip from that MSNBC interview that was referenced where um, she talks about her style of socialism and also what her first priority is going to be. And it's going to warm your heart to hear her speak about this. Joining me now is India Walton. Uh, Ms. Walton, thank you so much for your time. First of all, congratulations to you on this uh, historic uh, victory. Your opponent will be the first incumbent Buffalo mayor to lose since 1961. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo had this to say on Brown earlier. His campaign strategy, as I understand it, was basically uh, to uh, avoid engaging in a campaign. And then you had a very low turnout. We know that combination. We've seen that before. That doesn't work. I want to get your thoughts on why you won. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to speculate about it, as we just heard there from the governor giving us the, his, his political analysis. But what do you believe are the reasons for your victory? I believe we won because we organized. We have a message of care, love and hope that is resonant with working class Buffalo. Um, we organized and we won. As I noted, uh, you would be the country's first socialist mayor in more than 60 years. People like Governor Cuomo, again, have uh, called your win an anomaly. I, I want to hear from you what you think this means for the broader movement in the country and progressives generally. What does it mean for leftist politics nationally? And obviously, you're aware of how uh, those on the right use the term socialism to hammer uh, the Democratic Party generally. And wh what do you make of that, broadly speaking? The pandemic has proven that we can have social programs that prioritize people and working class families, and we can make efforts to reduce childhood poverty, and it works. Um, no one is returning their stimulus. We all enjoyed free health care and immunizations. Um, that, that is socialism. That is our government stepping up to take care of its people. And that is what we should expect as Americans, as New Yorkers, and as Buffalonians. If elected in the general election and you do become mayor of Buffalo, what do you feel needs to change in that city specifically? What would your priorities be as mayor? My priority is putting resources in neighborhoods um, and really tackling the issue of poverty. Uh, Buffalo is the third poorest city of our size in the country. It is unacceptable. We have um, disproportionately uh, poor health outcomes. We know that social determinants of health are on a lot of people's radar as um, an indicator of a successful community. So we are looking at getting to the root causes of concentrated poverty and disadvantage. So that was great. And I think that her message right there, really, that is the perfect way that you sell socialism to normal working Americans. Because even though we've made some progress, it still is the case that socialism, that's basically a boogeyman in the United States, like it or not. We have to push back against that. But the way that she is uh, selling it is she, she's trying to tell people that socialism isn't necessarily this foreign concept as it's been made out to be. It's actually a little bit more familiar. And she brings in familiar policies like the stimulus check. We all loved the stimulus check. We're not returning our stimulus checks. She pointed that out. Um, we got the socialism in the form of free healthcare immunizations with the COVID-19 shots. So these public policies, they work and they're extremely, extremely popular. So the way that she speaks about socialism, like not only is she kind of 
taking away like all the negative connotations and the smears that will inevitably come, even though like you're not going to disarm all of that. But she's bringing in people who are reluctant and don't necessarily like the word socialism, but she's getting them to think about this in a different way. Oh, well, you know, I like that the COVID-19 shot was free. I like the stimulus check. So it's brilliant. And politicians like her, like she is so good for the movement. Every single success, every victory that we have as a movement, I think needs to be celebrated because look, we don't get victories electorally speaking that frequently. So when we have a major one like this, especially an upset that wasn't expected by anyone, I think we have to celebrate it. And um, look, I, I'm really happy about this. We had a uh, really good meeting and to answer your direct question, we have a deal. And uh, I think it's really important We've all agreed that uh, none of us got what we all that we wanted. I clearly didn't get all I wanted. They gave more than I think maybe they were inclined to give in the first place. But this reminds me of the days we used to get an awful lot done up in the United States Congress. We actually worked with them. We had bipartisan deals. The bipartisan deals mean to compromise. One of the things that I've, I've made clear, I've signed on, and I'm going to let them give you the detail because and you can ask them, and I'm, I will, I will talk to you all later, next hour or two. But I promise you, I'm not going away. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, we agreed on infrastructure, we made serious compromises on both ends. Uh, there is, uh, and they'll they'll give you the numbers. But we did not, they did not, and I understand their position. Republicans and this group did not want to go along with. Any of my family plan issues, the child care tax credits, the human infrastructure that I talk about. And uh, that we'll see what happens in a reconciliation bill in the budget process. If that, uh, if we you get some compromise there, and if we can't, see if I can attract all the Democrats to a position that is there. But we're going to, they're going to move in a dual track. And, uh, and that's all I'll say. But I, I want to thank each and every one of them. It's been, you know, a lot of us go back a long way where we're used to doing one thing, give each other our word, and that's the end. That was President Joe Biden alongside some of the most loathsome people in the country announcing that they finally struck a deal on infrastructure. And that deal is so laughably bad that I have to think they've got to be trolling us. Like, it's laughable. It's very obviously an attempt for them to get something accomplished that they could take back to, to their constituents and say, look, we got this done. When in actuality, all of the really good things about this were taken out of it. And especially the provisions that lead to us investing in clean, green, renewable technology, which is really, really important for infrastructure. There was a moment in that video where it, it really, I don't know if I'm looking too much into this, but I really, I hate all of these folks. So you can just tell that I'm biased, but uh, Biden talked about how, you know, we, we removed the early childhood tax credit and mansion and cinema. They're just sitting there nodding along. Yep. We didn't agree with that. As if they're like proud that they got that removed. You should be embarrassed that that was taken out because that actually does help families. It has a concrete impact on the lives of millions of families. And you got that taken out and now you're celebrating that effectively. It's embarrassing. But there is a tiny, tiny little bit of hope to be left when it comes to whether or not there's going to be any progressive policy concessions that come out of this. I'm not necessarily too optimistic. In fact, I'm pretty skeptical. Having said that, though, uh, we're going to read a Common Dreams article that kind of breaks down what's in that bill and what could be done to possibly pass some progressive policy since they all got taken out of the infrastructure compromise. So as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams explains, President Joe Biden announced in front of the White House on Thursday that he reached a deal with a group of Republican and Democratic senators on an infrastructure framework that includes hundreds of billions of dollars in spending on roads, bridges, water systems, and broadband over the next half decade. The package, which Biden characterized 
characterized as the product of serious compromises on both ends will be far smaller than the president's original American jobs plan, which proposed roughly $2.2 trillion in new infrastructure spending over the next eight years. According to a fact sheet released by the White House, the bipartisan deal includes $579 billion in new infrastructure spending over the course of five years, with $309 billion going to transportation and $109 billion earmarked for roads, bridges, and other major projects. Speaking to reporters outside the White House, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, who led the bipartisan talks along with Senator Kirsten Sinema, said the blueprint will not include any new taxes. Instead, the framework proposes financing the plan by repurposing unspent unemployment insurance funds, reducing the IRS tax gap, and utilizing public-private partnerships and asset recycling. Progressive advocacy groups have warned that the latter two pay fors would hand public infrastructure over to corporations and Wall Street investors. And that's why they wanted it. Shortly before Biden announced the bipartisan agreement, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told reporters that the lower chamber will not vote on bipartisan infrastructure legislation until the Senate also passes a reconciliation bill containing Democratic priorities that were excluded from the compromise measure, including spending on social safety net programs, green energy, and more. Senator Bernie Sanders, chair of the Senate Budget Committee, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer are currently working on a $6 trillion reconciliation package that also includes a Medicare expansion and other progressive agenda items. Okay, so that last paragraph is particularly of interest to me. So when it comes to Nancy Pelosi's stipulation that we're not going to vote on this infrastructure compromise in the House until we vote on a reconciliation bill or until the Senate votes on a reconciliation bill, um, that is something that is important because that's one way that they can use the uh budget resolution to pass progressive priorities using budget reconciliation. Uh, and it seems as if Joe Biden is on board with that. He agrees that both bills basically have to be passed simultaneously. I expect that in the, the coming months this summer, before the, count, the, the fiscal year is over, that we will have voted on this bill as well, the infrastructure bill, as well as voted on the budget rec uh, uh, resolution. And that's when they'll, but if only one comes to me, I'm not, if this is the only thing that comes to me, I'm not signing. It's in tandem. Okay, so a lot is still up in the air. We don't necessarily know what is and isn't going to happen. But in the event, if, you know, they, they support this infrastructure proposal, the bipartisan compromise that it removes provisions that invest in clean, green, renewable technology, wind, solar, hydro, but... They have spending for this in, you know, the uh, budget resolution passed using uh, reconciliation with 50 uh, votes plus one. Is that a victory for the left? Um, it depends. Like, we have to see the details. I don't think anyone at this point can say that anyone is victorious at this point or is going to be victorious at this point in time because the details are still being hashed out when it comes to the budget resolution. So we have to basically wait and see. But if I'm a, a lawmaker... This is what I'm I'm saying. Uh, in the event that budget resolution does not contain a lot of concessions, especially investments in clean, green, renewable technology, like a Green New Deal light, I'm not voting for it. And progressives have got to stand firm here. And, and for the most part, to their credit, they have they've said very clearly, no climate, no deal. And Mondaire Jones retweeted himself with a meme that suggests that they're not going to budge. If they don't get concessions when it comes to climate change and addressing climate change, then they're not going to support this infrastructure bill. Now, if Biden ends up weakening what's offered in the budget resolution and cites some bullshit excuse about the, you know, Senate parliamentarian or Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema. I think that progressives cannot agree to support the infrastructure plan because basically everything that you wanted in that infrastructure package got removed. So if you don't get some really strong concrete concessions in the budget res resolution, then um, don't support it. Threaten to torpedo it if you have to. Stay strong. No climate. No deal. You have to draw a line in the sand. And if any money is going to go towards infrastructure, but we're, we're not simultaneously trying to do even the most minimal amount that we can to mitigate climate change, you've got to tank it. 
make them get back to the drawing board. And, and look, this they're going to get blamed in the media if this happens. Like, we're talking hypotheticals at this point. But if progressives have to end up tanking this, yes, the media is going to demonize them. The moderates will look victorious. But they've got to fight. They've got to stand strong. Because if they get rolled here, you know, it's it's not going to bode well for the future of uh, their agenda. If they can't use, uh, you know, this opportunity right now. So, you know, that... What is in that that budget reconciliation package, uh, the, the budget resolution that they're going to be voting on with 51 votes? That is going to be so important. Keep an eye out for that. I do trust Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is trying to basically expand Medicare to more people. He's trying to work in student debt cancellation. So Bernie Sanders is going to try to make it as progressive as possible. So it, it depends on like what gets left out of what Bernie is proposing, because I'm assuming there's going to be some compromises there as well. And I put compromise in quotes because it's going to be more demands made from corporate Democrats. Because still, even though they're using budget reconciliation, they need 50 votes. And Kamala Harris will be the tiebreaker. But if it gets a little bit too progressive, then Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, they might say, well, you know what? I don't like that there's an increase to the minimum wage. I don't like that there is an expansion for Medicare in there, so let's take it out. And so if that's the case, if you water down that as well after the moderates got basically a watered-down infrastructure package that's laughably weak and woefully inadequate, then progressives have got to sink this bill. They've got to throw their weight around because this doesn't pass without the moderates, but it also doesn't pass without progressives. So now is the time to make demands and you know we'll we'll have to leave that there i'll reserve judgment for what's in the package uh but i really really hope that progressives have formed a cohesive plan and they're going to be united here and i i hope that they you know when they said no climate no deal they meant it because now is the time where the spotlight's on them and you know if they let us down here you know this is going to hurt the movement overall so i really really hope that they fight and so far they haven't showed any signs that they're going to be backing down. So I, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers and toes that the left doesn't get screwed. Having said that, though, I'm skeptical. I'm going to, uh, you know, hope for the best, but brace for the absolute worst because this is American politics. And that's usually the way that things go. We don't get too many victories on the left. So, look, it's a game of wait and see for those of us on the outside. Well, folks, that is everything. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the program, um, as usual, we're not going to end without thanking all of the folks who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. Thank you all so much. Um, look, there's so much that I want to plug. Uh, Thursdays at 7 p.m. PST, uh, twitch.tv slash humanist report. I'm talking politics. I'm playing video games sometimes. On top of that, every single Wednesday now at 6 p.m. PST right here on the YouTube channel, uh, you can watch Dystopian Times, which is a live panel show where, you know, we'll talk about politics and, and you know, random stuff. And uh, it's not just me. I am getting the input from other individuals. I actually get to talk with people, which is a uh, Nice, because I've been talking to the camera by myself for a while, so it's nice to get, you know, some feedback from other individuals. Uh, having said that, though, that's that's it. I, I'm spent. I've got nothing left to talk about. I will see you all next week. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care, everyone.